All right, thank you, Norris, and so good to be back at Forge Road. And uh, I'm amongst friends, even though it looks like it's the Wild West out there with everybody <laughs> wearing a mask. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm privileged to inaugurate this new season uh, and honored to be here. It's always uh, nice to receive an invitation to come back to uh, Forge Road. And of course, uh, it's every three years I do the retreat, right? You know, that's our tradition. So looking forward to the next one as well. But at any rate, uh, good to see you all. Our text today is found in Luke chapter 11. And uh, we're going to be looking at the matter of prayer uh, as Jesus taught his disciples to pray. How many sermons have you heard on prayer? Probably if you've been in the church for any length of time, you've heard a lot of sermons on prayer, perhaps even from this particular text. But what I would like to do uh, today is to draw our attention to how Luke develops this idea uh, by four principles from Luke chapter 11. And those principles are going to be able to help us understand the mind of God and how we're supposed to interact with him and communicate with God. And so uh, let's look at these four principles together from Luke chapter 11. And before we do, let's bow in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. What a privilege it is to be able to proclaim the truth of God's word, to be able to hear your thoughts. And we uh, want today to be a reflection of that, that we have met together as a congregation, and we have found that you have met with us and spoken to us. We each come with needs today, especially in the matter of prayer. We pray that you would expand our understanding that we'd be challenged and renewed in this matter of prayer, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, of these four principles, the opening one is probably the most familiar, and that's in Luke chapter 11, the first four verses, where we find Jesus giving what has been called the Lord's Prayer. And you'll notice that I'm calling this subversive conversation. And there's an important reason why I do this. Four years ago at uh, my first retreat with Forge Road, I spoke uh, at least one session on the Lord's Prayer. And so not that I'm expecting anybody to remember that, but I remember it. And uh, so it's not as if this is a new passage. Obviously, we're all familiar it's, uh, with this. It's the most familiar text, perhaps, in Scripture for many people. You'd be hard-pressed to walk down the street and find anyone who cannot say the Lord's Prayer, regardless of their faith, regardless of their affiliation. But I'm concerned that we may need a revolutionary change of mind as to how we think of the Lord's Prayer in this matter of prayer. And I think that that's what comes through in this passage as well. What do you think of when you see this idea of subversive conversation? One scholar, N.T. Wright, said that rightly prayed, the Lord's Prayer is the risky, crazy prayer of subversion and commission. I don't think most people think of the Lord's Prayer that way. And another scholar, a guy by the name of David Wells, said to meaningfully pray the Lord's Prayer is to rebel against the status quo. And he's written a great article on that topic to challenge us with the ideas that Jesus encapsulated in this amazing prayer. Well, we're looking at Luke 11, but the Lord's Prayer, as you probably know, occurs in two passages, Matthew chapter 6 as well as Luke 11. Look at, looking at Luke 11, 1, we see that this prayer was prompted by a request from the disciples. They had noticed that John the Baptist was teaching his disciples to pray. We don't know if he, he gave them a prayer to pray or showed them, here's how you talk to God or how that worked out. Uh, but they were certainly impressed enough with it to come to Jesus and say, teach us to pray. Just like John taught his disciples. They liked what they saw. They wanted to understand how to pray. We don't know what background they brought to prayer. Maybe they'd only heard prayers that were not very meaningful, perhaps very ritualistic. We don't know. Uh, but they certainly liked what John was doing with his disciples and hoped that Jesus would do the same. 
And so in Luke's approach to the Lord's Prayer, Jesus responds by saying, when you pray, say. All right, so it's a very simple, kind of concise statement. Here's what to say. Matthew's approach is a little bit different. Matthew says, when you pray, pray this way, pray in this way, thereby cueing in his disciples that he's not actually giving them a prayer that he wants to, them to pray, like repeat after me kind of thing, but a way to pray. And so we would look then at the Lord's Prayer to understand what is this way that Jesus wants his disciples to pray? How is this to happen? What manner? And so we come to the Lord's Prayer, and we find that the way Jesus is going to tell his disciples to pray is not a tame kind of lethargic prayer that perhaps you have prayed as I have at one point or another, and you hear it prayed by individuals who've given rarely any, if a little, if any thought to actually what they're saying. They've got it memorized. This is a ritual that we do. This is not at all what Jesus uh, wants his disciples to pick up on. There are three aspects to the prayer, both in Matthew and in Luke. These three aspects kind of shape this prayer and tell us the way to pray. The first aspect, of course, is relational. And it begins with us saying, Father. Matthew says, Our Father. And so we have this opening relational element. We come to God, our Father, in prayer, and that means we're in a relationship with Him. We're not going through a religious practice. We're not doing things out of duty, but this is personal. We have a connection to the one to whom we're praying. The second aspect of this prayer is the idea of the kingdom of God. That is, God has aspects to his kingdom that he wants his disciples to pray about, and Jesus is going to highlight them. There are actually three, though Luke only gives us two of the three. And those two are, hallowed be your name and your kingdom come. Matthew gives us the third, which we're all familiar with, your will be done. So there's three requests, and these are requests. These are not declarative statements, like we're making declarations to God. We're asking God to do these things, to hallow his name, to cause his kingdom to come, and to have his will be done. This is what we want him to do. And finally, this is followed by the personal requests that we might have concerning our daily bread, our sins, and going into temptation. All of this is personal, it's more what we would naturally want. And so the order is important here because it compels us to start with what God is most passionate about, his name, his kingdom, his will. And so we begin there, the order then t telling us this is a way to approach prayer. This is not a prayer to be droned on about. This is not a repetition of mindless statements, a ritual of sorts. The disciples were not being told to say this just so they could say words. It, it elevates prayer to a special level, and hopefully our hearts are stirred that, yes, I want that in my prayer life. I want to be in a relationship with God where this is more than just going through a ritual. These are prayer requests that the Father in heaven loves to hear from his disciples. Well, because of its context in Matthew 6 and Luke 11, we realize that the focus of this prayer is the focus of Jesus' heart. His heart is that his kingdom would come, that he would rule in the hearts and souls of men and women, that his reign would pervade everything, and consequently this prayer is driven by that. That's what he wants the disciples to understand. And when we talk to our Father in heaven, talk to him about the single most important thing on earth, and that is that Jesus reign on the thrones of human hearts, that the kingdom of God be real and active. And in this prayer, we are invited to overthrow the kingdoms of this world. 
That's why Wells calls this rebellion against the status quo. What's going on in our world is the status quo. Disciples say, that's not right. That shouldn't be happening. What can I do about it? And the answer Jesus would give, at least this, is we pray about it. We pray for the, for the overthrow of the status quo. Now, in this passage, I'm not going to focus too much on the Lord's Prayer today, but that sets the stage for what is going to follow in this text. We might ask, well, if I pray this prayer, wait, how do I do it? What, what attitude should I bring to prayer? How should I approach my Heavenly Father in prayer? Do I come timidly, uncertainly, in confusion, obnoxiously arrogant? You know, what possible way should I be approaching God in prayer? And as if to answer that question, Luke will immediately follow the Lord's Prayer with a parable. And it's a parable that we're probably all familiar with, the parable of one neighbor uh, interacting with another neighbor. And so that brings us then to the second principle, which is neighbor asking neighbor, found in verses 5 to 8. And as the Lord's Prayer is subversive, subversive conversation, the way we are to pray is with shameless audacity. Shameless audacity. You may be looking at your particular uh, translation, perhaps, and not see shameless audacity. So I'll, I'll explain that in just a moment. But we're all familiar, perhaps, with this incident or this parable that Jesus gives to expand on verses 1 to 4. And what he does is he creates a story that prompts visual images in our minds. How do you picture this incident? where you have this man sound asleep. A neighbor comes at midnight. I mean, you want to, I'm never up at midnight. I don't know about all of you, but I don't want to hear anybody knocking on my door. I don't want a phone call at midnight, and I don't want the doorbell to ring. But this guy comes at midnight who had a traveler show up, and he needs help. He doesn't have the customary provisions in the ancient world near East that you would offer to a guest who has arrived. He's embarrassed. And so Jesus is going to set the stage for this by telling us the basic elements of what's going on here. And so we read in verse 5 and 6, he said to them, imagine one of you. Remember, he's still talking to his disciples. He's just given the Lord's Prayer. Imagine one of you has a friend. And... And, and shall go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, give me three loaves of bread. For a friend of mine has come to me from a journey, and I have nothing to put before him. It's pretty apparent this is pretty reckless, pretty audacious. Imagine him uh, trying to drum up the nerve to think, Man, i got to go wake up my friend. I know he's not a night owl. He's been in bed for a couple hours. He's probably snoring away. His family's sacked out. Can I do this? And so he had to work himself up to get to this point where he would do this. This is kind of a reckless, brash, audacious kind of action. Well, how does the person respond? Remember, it's a friend. It's a friend to a friend. And so the friend says in verse 7, don't bother me. I mean, here, feel that that would be your response. We don't want to admit it, do we? But we would at least be thinking that. Oh, man, please leave me alone. This is not the time. Don't bother me. The door has been shut. My children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. Now, of course, he can get up, but he doesn't want to give it, get up. And so he's basically saying, no. Now, how is this? first neighbor going to respond to his sleepy neighbor? That's the question. What do you do? And what does this have to do with prayer? Uh, but Jesus gives us a little bit of a mind into the, uh, into, or a little bit of a window into the mind of this sleepy neighbor. And I just love this sketch. You can picture this guy. He's not a happy camper. He doesn't look happy at all. 
and his hair's disheveled, he's got a grumpy look on his face, that would be us probably. The poor guy coming to his door is feeling really terrible now because this guy looks horrible and he's really ticked off at him. I just love this sketch because it captures so much of what is going on. He's got his two little kids, they've been stirred out of bed now, one's rubbing their eyes and the other one's hiding behind him. It's just all perfect, isn't it? Anybody see your family here in this little sketch? And so uh, Jesus says, well, what's, what's going on in this guy's mind? And he says, I say to you, this is his explanation. I say to you, he's not going to get up and give him anything just because he's his friend. Friendship is not enough to prompt him to give this guy what he wants. But because he has this shameless audacity, Jesus says he will get up and give him what he needs. So I picture this guy standing in the doorway saying, wow, look how desperate my friend is. Think of the passion that brought him to my house. It's a small thing for me to be inconvenienced when someone is that needy. And so he's moved with some sense of compassion some pity upon his friend. He realizes, if I were to do this, it would take a lot to get me to do this. So I know it took a lot for him to do it as well. This phrase, shameless audacity, uh, only occurs in your Bible if you're looking at the NIV, uh, which has shameless audacity. And that speaks to passion and urgency. It's not just persistence as the New American Standard Bible might have. Shameless boldness is a little closer. That's the uh, Christian Standard Bible. The ESV has impudence. And uh, others have persistence as well. And what that tells us in these various translations is that this is not an easy word to translate. If it were easy, everybody would have the same thing, right? But it's not an easy term. Three things come from this parable. Three ideas. First of all, friendship is not sufficient to get this sleepy neighbor out of bed. Well, think about that for a moment. Of course, this is a parable about prayer, and we'd like to think God answers our prayers if the sleepy neighbor is God in the parable. We'd like to think God answers our prayers because we're friends with God. He likes us. He loves us. We're his children. But that's not the point of this parable. That's true, and we'll see that in a minute. See, the Bible often emphasizes different aspects of prayer in different passages. And we'll see in just a moment how a relationship between God and the petitioner is a vital aspect of prayer. That is not the emphasis here. So the first idea is that friendship is not sufficient. However, the second idea is shamelessness or shameless audacity is sufficient. There's something about shameless audacity that prompts a response. And the third idea is that this appears to be what's called a how much more kind of argument. How much more? And that is, take this guy, this sleepy neighbor, and he's not for a moment inclined to help his neighbor who has this problem. But he does so out of shameless audacity. Now, if we were to extrapolate out of that to the idea of prayer, Luke is say, or Jesus is saying, as Luke recorded, that how much more would our Father in heaven respond to those who come to him with shameless audacity? How much more might he do that? Jesus likes this how much more argumentation because it's often part of first century culture as well, where they would argue this way. And we'll see it shows up again before we're done this morning. <clears throat> so we're left to conclude something here, and that is Jesus wants his followers to come to their father with shameless audacity. 
not thinking about the consequences, not worried about how he's going to respond, to come with shameless audacity as they pray for the fulfillment of the Father's purposes and agenda, which is the content of the Lord's Prayer. When we come with shameless audacity, gritting our teeth, we have urgency, we have passion, fervor, ardor, and we say, Father, hallow your name. We don't just say words calmly. We are urgent about that. We look at our world and say, his name must be hallowed. We look at our culture and say, his kingdom has to come. This ain't working. And I so long for his will to be done because it's done so seldom when we come in that fashion. That's what Jesus wants. But how does this kind of prayer work, you might ask? What does it mean that I would approach the Father in prayer with shameless audacity? Can you flesh it out just a little bit? And Jesus says, yes, I'll do that right now. And he gives three commands to help us understand how to come to the Father in prayer with shameless audacity. And so that brings us to the third principle, which is the three commands which illustrate earnest pleadings. Luke 11, verses 9 and 10, three commands. And we're very familiar with this passage as well, when Jesus says, I say to you, Notice this comes right out of the previous story of the two neighbors. And so the thinking continues. What he said about the Lord's Prayer led him to talk about the two neighbors. What he said about the two neighbors led him to give these three commands. This is all interconnected. I say to you, ask, seek, knock. Notice there's a context for this. And the context is the same as in Matthew. In fact, the words that you see here, Luke 11, 9, and 10, are identical with Matthew 7, verses 7 and 8. And in both passages, Jesus is talking about the urgency of the kingdom of God and that his followers would be on a quest for the kingdom of God. And so this is not just a generic kind of You know, whatever pops into your head, pray about it. You can do that. God's not offended by that. But that's not the point of these three commands. These three commands are kingdom-oriented. Ask the Father that his name would be hallowed, his kingdom would come, and his will would be done. Seek for the hallowing of his name. Look for it. Be on a quest for it. For the kingdom of God and for his will to be done. And knock. As if there's a door that will open, that will allow you to see and be a part of the hallowing of the name of God and the coming of the kingdom of God and the doing of the will of God. And he assures his disciples, anybody that asks this kind of thing, how in the Father in heaven is, how is he ever going to possibly deny that? Would he ever say, this disciple has come to me about the hallowing of my name and the and the coming of my kingdom, and the, and the doing of my will, and I'm not really very happy with that kind of prayer. I mean, it sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? Obviously, the Father in heaven is thrilled to hear this kind of thing, and so consequently, this kind of person who prays this will receive and will find, and things will be opened up for them. So we have this both in Matthew and Luke in the same context. This is the way Jesus says in Luke 11 that shameless audacity works. You want to see it in practice? Take these three commands and pray them with shameless audacity for the purposes of the Father in heaven. So we might say then that the disciples' pursuit of the Father's agenda is to be done with earnest pleadings. It's not something that we can be casual about. If you live in this world and you're aware of what's going on in this world, casualness is no longer a possibility. It's too disturbing. Perhaps we need God just to pull back the window a little bit and to show us just how awful evil can be. 
how mendacious the enemy of Jesus Christ can be. Maybe we need to see that, and we've had some opportunities to see that. Rather than turning on those people, we need to be saying, Father, this reaffirms to me that your name is not being hallowed as it should. I rebel against that. And your kingdom is not coming. It's coming far too little. And your will is being done way too infrequently. I rebel against those ideas. And I'm asking and I'm seeking and I'm knocking with passion and fervency that you, the only one who can affect that, would change that. And God's not reluctant, is he? He wants us to ask persistently and urgently as our prayers focus on his kingdom agenda. Well, that leads us right into the fourth principle. And that is the idea that sons, children can ask fathers and have confident expectancy. You see the idea here that subversive conversation is carried out with shameless audacity, which leads the petitioner into earnest pleadings that are offered up with confident expectancy. This whole last part is built on the idea of a parent-child relationship. What do you think of when you see a parent and a child or a picture of a parent or a child? What do you think of a child's request of a father? Is it brought with confident expectancy? Or perhaps a little bit with timidity or fear? Maybe even angry resentment. I realize as we come into this passage that there's all kinds of experiences in this congregation with fathers and mothers. You may have had bad home environments. You may have had good ones. If you had good ones, you can jump right into this parable and eat it up. If not, you might struggle with it a little bit. A number of years ago, I worked at a, at a summer camp for troubled kids from Harlem. Was there for the whole summer. Every two weeks, they'd bring in a new kid, a new group of kids, and I would have about 10 or 12 in a cabin. And boy, was that a whirlwind experience. And our teaching for the summer, before they came, we were taken and tutored on how we were going to teach the Gospel of John to these kids. And uh, I had my mind blown because the guy who was training us said, the first thing you've got to understand is that the Gospel of John is all about Jesus' relationship with his father. The second thing you need to understand is that you probably won't have any kids this summer who've had any positive relationship with a father. And right away I thought, well, I never would have even considered that because I had such a great relationship with my dad. But it, it reinforced to me the thinking then that the way we approach Scripture when it speaks of the father as our heavenly father and as us as sons and daughters who come to him like a father. We sang good, good father out there, I think, didn't we? I came in a little early. But when we think of him that way, not everybody does. And so you may know of a cruel, selfish, or absentee father. Remember the Lord's Prayer begins with the word father in Luke 11. I mean, right away, we're either off to a good start or a bad start. But we want to start off thinking of the father the way Jesus thinks of his heavenly father. So he starts this fourth principle with a hypothetical. He says, now, suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. You're not going to give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? It's almost absurd. Or if he's asked for an egg, he's not going to give him a scorpion, will he? So you see there's a certain logic to the questions which expect an answer of, no, of course not. I'm not going to give my child something that's going to be harmful, like a snake or a scorpion, if they just ask for food. No, none of us would do that. So then he says, in each one of these, you notice how he 
has a little bit of a point of application. So here's the way this works then. If you then, being evil, there's the if clause. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, now the then clause, how much more then shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? You see that phrase, how much more, those three words? We talked about that earlier. It wasn't said in the story of the two neighbors, but it was implied there. Here, it's right out in the open. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? If you're reading in, Luke, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 11, Jesus says these same words, except he says, how much more will your heavenly Father give good things to those who ask him? And so the Implicit intention is not necessarily that people like us who have received the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit dwells within us to manifest Christ in our lives want to get the Holy Spirit again. That's not the point of the passage, but that the benefits of the Holy Spirit, the voice of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Spirit, all of that would become more meaningful to the disciple. So when he says good things, we think, well, I've asked God for a lot of things, and they haven't always been good when I got the answers. And that's kind of part of this whole dilemma of prayer, isn't it? In other words, the good things, good things that God gives us may not always look good. And probably all of us have experienced that. My wife and I send out a newsletter every month on the first of the month, email. And in our June newsletter, I talked about an incident back in the early 90s when I was an oil deliverer for Carroll Independent Fuel. And I was making my rounds to homes in Baltimore City, delivering oil to row houses. That's what you go to seminary for, right? So there I was doing this. And... Uh, one day, as I finished putting in 200 gallons of fuel oil in this house, that's $200, it was about 99 cents a gallon at the time. As I finished putting it in, I put this, took the ticket to put it in the door, and I realized that the ticket, uh, the number on the ticket did not match the address. I had put 200 gallons of oil in the wrong house. And I was so upset. I was barely making it as it was. I had three small kids at home. We had a mortgage, everything else. And I had a conversation with God about this. And I basically said, Lord, I've given everything to you. What's in my checking account is yours. My house is yours. My family is yours. Everything I have is yours. If you want to take $200 out of your checking account and give it to these people, that's your decision. Now, I actually said that and thought that, but I never thought God would actually do it. I thought he would see the warmth in, in my heart and my, my love for him and the fact that I had forsaken all to follow him. And he said, I can't do that to this poor guy. And he would figure out a way to get the money back. Well, I knocked on that door for weeks. Every time I was in that neighborhood, I would stop. I got their phone number. I would call. Nobody ever answered. I wrote letters. No response. And that's what, 29 years ago? I'm still waiting to hear from those people. So I asked God. He's a good God and he does good things, right? So therefore, I'm going to get that money back. No. See, when God gives us good things, it doesn't mean he gives us what we want, it may mean he gives us what is best or what is necessary. That's good of God, isn't it? I mean, after all, this is a parable about fathers. Those of us that are parents, we know what we give to our kids is not always what we, they want because what they want may not be best. It may not be necessary. And so we understand then that our Father in heaven is freed to give us what is best and what is necessary not perhaps in the way we might think that he should give it. So this how much more argument that we see here 
is so important that we understand. Flesh it out just a little bit as we close here. In Luke 11, we have this, these questions. Uh, can I have a fish? Jesus says, you won't give him a snake. Can I have an egg? You're not going to give him a scorpion. In Matthew, Matthew records him saying, if a, if a child asks for bread, you won't give him a stone or a fish and give him a snake. You know, so very similar kinds of statements are being made here. And of course, Jesus is pe- appealing to what people normally perceive parents do. Good parents, here's what you do. And if you're a good parent, when asked for essential items, you don't offer harmful or useless ones. That stone's not going to do your child a bit of good if they're hungry. And that snake or scorpion is probably going to do a good bit of harm to your child. And so these are essential items. These are good items. You're not going to get the wrong things from your parents. They're going to give you what is best for you. If it were to have been changed somehow and said, uh, if your child asks you for Briar's ice cream, would you give him a frog? I don't know. I'm kind of freewheeling it here at the moment. In other words, we might say, you know, for a child who might say, hey, Dad, can I have Briar's ice cream for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day? They might say that with the cutest smile on their face and with the deepest amount of sincerity in their heart, but you know you're not going to do that. Why? That's not best for your child, and it's not necessary. There are other things that are better, but children don't know that. When we ask God for things, we don't know always what is best. And so Jesus says, then, if you, then being evil, know how to give good gifts To your children, how much more shall your heavenly father, your perfectly, your perfect heavenly father, give what is good to those who ask him? And that same question Jesus asked in Luke also in Matthew chapter 7. So this how much more argumentation basically says if something is true on a small scale... How much more true is it on a larger scale? If something is true, that even fallen, sinful fathers and mothers can do a good thing for their child, how much more your Father in heaven? We could apply that back to verses 5 to 8. Remember the two neighbors, the sleepy neighbor and the neighbor with the guest? There we saw that uh, uh, this idea of shameless audacity surfaces. If shameless audacity in requesting moves the host to give his neighbor something that he needs, how much more will a gracious God grant the requests of his friends? Here in verses 11 to 13, it works very similarly. If a request that is submitted out of a genuine need and moves a sinful father to give graciously and generously to his child, how much more will our Heavenly Father grant the requests of his children? So let me conclude by summarizing this passage. Luke 11, 1 to 13, three observations. The first one, Jesus wants his fathers, his followers to come to the Father and pray for the hallowing of his name, the coming of his kingdom, and the doing of his will. He wants us to do that. See, we've been liberated from the cares and concerns of our own personal needs, that we don't need to badger our Father in heaven with what we want. He already knows that. Jesus said that twice in Matthew 6 in the Sermon on the Mount. Before you ask, he already knows what you need. So we're free to come to him and pray for the things that are on his agenda. The second idea is that this is an asking, seeking. What happened there? Well, there we go. This is an asking, seeking, and knocking that is done with shameless audacity. 
And the third observation is this, if sinful humans can find it in themselves to respond favorably to normal earthly requests, how much more will their loving and compassionate Father answer their extraordinary heavenly requests with generosity and grace?